pleased to introduce uh, Saketa Chavanchala and Siddharth Bagel, both from Cloudera, who will talk to us about the making of an exabyte scale data lake house. So please join me in welcoming them. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Saketa Chalumchala. I'm a senior software engineer at Cloudera. Uh, and I have here uh, my colleague uh, uh, Siddharth Agle, who's a director of engineer at uh, Cloudera. And we are going to talk about today uh, the requirements of making an exabyte uh, scale data lake house and how Apache, Ozone, and Iceberg fit into the picture. So this is how the agenda looks for the talk today. Uh, so we're going to talk about uh, data lake house requirements and how Apache, Ozone fits the bill. A uh, quick show of hands, how many of you are familiar with ozone? Okay, so a few of you. <laughs> okay, so yeah, so we're going to talk about how Apache Ozone fits the bill and going to delve into a deep dive of uh, ozone architecture. And then we're going to talk about uh, sizing recommendations for a lake house. And uh, then we're going to uh, look at some migration stories uh, to uh, figure out how you can move your existing data into uh, your lake, onto Apache Ozone uh, storage. And then uh, we are also going to take a look at uh, how Iceberg uh, benefits uh, you uh, when you are running analytics on large data sets in your lake house. And then we have a couple of demos. Uh, uh, we have, uh, uh, our team has simulated an exabyte cluster uh, on ozone storage. So we're going to look at a small demo uh, that is uh, uh, simulating this. Uh, and then we also have another small demo uh, where we show how it easy it is to run your workloads, uh, existing workloads on ozone, basically. So let's start off with defining a data lake house. A uh, data lake house is meant to provide the benefits of both a data warehouse and a data lake. Uh, like a data warehouse, uh, you have uh, you can store structured data in your uh, data lake house, and you can uh, in raw formats and in transform formats, so that they can be consumed by data analytics applications or BI tools. And like a data lake, you can also store uh, unstructured data as well as structured data into your uh, data lake house and uh, consume them uh, for uh, data exploration or data science or MLAI along with your BI reporting uh, or data analytics. And um, along with uh, uh, providing the benefits of both the warehouse and the data lake, you also have a unified layer of security and government, uh, governance, as well as a meta a predefined uh, schema on top of the uh, data. So it makes integration with uh, your various and, uh, consumption tools and pro data processing tools easier. So uh, on a high level, uh, these are the requirements for a data lake house. It's, uh, uh, it is good to have your data la lake house be cost efficient uh, because uh, especially if you want to grow uh, your data lake house to exabytes and uh, to multiple exabytes of data, you want your uh, architecture to be cost efficient. And uh, also the data lake must uh, support storing uh, all types of structured and unstructured data, databases, tables. Uh, PDFs, uh, videos, images, and so on. Um, again, as I've mentioned before, uh, uh, data lake house benefits from a unified security governance and metadata layer so that your integration with various tools becomes easier. And uh, separation of storage and compute uh, uh, makes it easier to scale. Uh, you can scale based on whether you are uh, experiencing data explosion or if you require uh, more compute power for your workloads. And uh, a data lake, another requirement for a data lake house is uh, concurrent access to data. Uh, so it would be helpful if your data lake house can support asset transactions so that uh, uh, multiple users can access data concurrently. And um, also it would be helpful if you, you are, if the data lake house supports access to the data through multiple industry standard protocols. So again, uh, it's easier for your various existing analytics tools to uh, talk to the data lake house without too much development effort. Then uh, why does Ozone fit the bill? So Ozone, um, as some of you might be aware, is uh, a highly scalable object store. Uh, we have uh, tested uh, Ozone. Uh, we have scaled, tested uh, about 10 billion objects on Ozone. We scaled it up. Uh, so that accounted to about like 4 TB in uh, metadata space. 
So, uh, and we do expect Ozone to handle even more uh, data. Uh, and uh, it's an ideal choice for, uh, and there are various features in Apache Ozone that make it an ideal choice of uh, storing both unstructured and structured data, uh, which we will talk about a little bit later. Um, and uh, along with Iceberg, which is a uh, open data format meant for petabyte scale analysis, uh, will uh, provide uh, an ideal uh, storage layer for your data lakehouse. So you can, uh, since uh, Apache Ozone is uh, provides out of the box integration with most data analytics, BI tools, and uh, uh, data science and AI ML libraries, uh, you can connect your existing workloads to an o o Ozone uh, storage layer without much difficulty, and you can scale up to exabyte uh, scale storage, and you can run large workloads that analyze uh, large petabyte scale uh, datasets. So this is a brief high-level overview of ozone. Uh, ozone, uh, as I mentioned before, is highly scalable. Uh, scalable. You can scale up to billions of objects of data, exabytes of data, uh, and uh, it's also highly performant. So there are features in ozone uh, that uh, make running data analytics jobs like uh, Hive, Spark, and Impala. Um, th that's a little bit faster when compared to other object stores. So we will talk about those optimization in the next slide. Um, and it's also a fully replicated system, so it's highly available. Uh, we are using Raft, which is a consensus algorithm for uh, consistency. Uh, and uh, Ozone also supports access through S3 API as well as uh, Hadoop compatible file system API. So uh, you should be able to migrate most workloads uh, to Ozone without too much effort. And uh, uh, we, Ozone supports erasure coding uh, for data integrity as well as three-way replication. Uh, so we're doing the three-way application with Apache Datus, which is, a, again, an implementation of Raft consensus algorithm. There are also snapshots available with Ozone for uh, uh, you to maintain history of your data and to uh, recover data when it is accidentally deleted or corrupted. Uh, Ozone provides uh, Ozone has an integration with Kerberos for authentication, and it uh, provides native ACLs as well as integration with the Apache Ranger for authorization. Uh, encryption is also supported at uh, bucket level uh, for uh, data uh, at rest and also over the wire. Um, and uh, since metadata in Ozone is uh, uh, stored on SSDs, uh, its uh, recovery time for uh, Ozone demons is faster because you don't have to load uh, data into memory. And uh, the architecture, as uh, Sid will talk about later, is uh, simpler when compared to HDF uh, uh, file system, distributed file systems like HDFS. So it's easier to manage, and then Ozone is designed to run on commodity hardware, and uh, you can use dense storage for, for your data nodes, so uh, it makes Ozone a cost-efficient method, um, uh, cost-efficient uh, storage, basically. Uh, there are other differentiators for Ozone. Uh, so Ozone, um, uh, there's uh, optimized bucket layouts. So there are buckets in Ozone can be optimized for file system and object store uh, operations. So atomic renames uh, and deletes are available with FSO buckets. So uh, analytic engines like uh, Hive, Impala, Spark that require atomic uh, renames and uh, deletes benefit from having Ozone as a storage as well as uh, um, the job committers in like Spark, Yarn uh, that do rename operations from staging locations to final locations. Uh, they run faster on Ozone when compared to other object stores. And uh, uh, there's interoperability also uh, with Ozone. Uh, you can use S3 API and HFS API to talk to, uh, to read from file system optimized buckets. So you can store data once in Ozone and access them through multiple um, protocols. So you can uh, deploy use cases where uh, you want to do analytics uh, using uh, the file system protocol on Ozone and then consume it through S3 API. Uh, and then, uh, Ozone snapshots is another differentiator. So with Iceberg, uh, there is a feature that's available to you, which is time travel. So you can go back in time over a single database. But with uh, Ozone snapshots, you can uh, complement that feature and travel back in time across multiple data sets and tables as well. And um, Iceberg uh, provides uh, uh, faster uh, query execution times by storing the metadata on uh, uh, data on the object store itself. And then this metadata will contain uh, ranges of uh, data in, within the data file. So it's if data files themselves are a little bit smaller, it's easier for Iceberg to restrict 
the queries to the relevant uh, set of data files. So uh, small files, having small files on storage is not an issue on Ozone as it is on uh, storage systems like HDFS, uh, since there's no limitation to how much you can scale and um, the size of the data files. Uh, with that, I will uh, hand it over to my colleague, Sid Wagley, who's going to uh, talk about the detailed ozone architecture. Thank you, Saketa. All right, quick intro about me. I'm a Hadoop committer, uh, ozone Rattis committer and PMC. My day job is to manage the storage team at Cloudera. All right. So uh, what I decided to do is uh, actually start walking over with the HDFS architecture. I think most people would kind of be very familiar with this, right? So this is a very quick overview of HDFS and we'll see how Ozone evolved from that. Why is that? Is because pretty much all of us at Cloudera who took up Ozone uh, were actually HDFS guys, right? So we evolved from there. So it kind of shows the journey of the product and, you know, what decisions were made uh, as we evolved Ozone. All right, so quick refresher. So uh, the reason why HDFS is so widely adopted and omnipresent is because it works on commodity hardware. Right, so you have data nodes, uh, run of the mill data nodes. Right, uh, you have uh, your uh, architecture with uh, active and standby name node forming a high availability pair. Uh, you have ZKFC, which is the Zookeeper failover controller, providing functions like fencing, so to figure out which one is active and make sure only one of them is active. Uh, you have a quorum of journal nodes. This is what stores the transaction log, or the edit log for the name node, uh, and it's always a quorum and is highly available. The client always always writes metadata to the active name node. Uh, it streams chunks and blocks to the data nodes and streams it in a streaming fashion. Right? We use chain replication in GFS, which is proven to work pretty well. The active name node peri periodically goes to the journal nodes and uh, uh, basically it writes all of the edit log to the journal nodes, right? And one the, what the standby does is reads the edits from the journal node and it will do checkpointing, right? Why does it do that? It writes all of the checkpointed uh, journal data into an FS image. Now, what is an FS image? FS image is the serialized view of your namespace tree. Right. So like any other file system or database, if, uh, the memory model of uh, the name node actually is uh, a tree like structure. Right. Look, uh, if you think of a, a traditional, um, you know, um, B tree kind of structure, right? that's what it looks like when it is all exploded into the memory. Uh, what the active name node does when it comes up is that loads the FS image from disks and actually builds this structure in memory. What are the other responsibilities of the name node, right? It also does, uh, listens to the heartbeats from the data nodes, get all the, gets all the block reports, uh, discovers the state of the cluster when the heartbeats come in from the data nodes, right? Uh, it also does balancing of blocks, uh, making sure topology awareness is uh, satisfied, replication criteria are met, and all of those good things. All right, so this is basically a very high level picture of how HDFS works. Now, um, what does a name node specifically have in its memory and what does it do, right? So your FS image has an inode map, right? This is your references to your files and all of the file metadata, right? So it stores the permissions, the ACLs, the block map, what have you. Uh, additionally, it also processes block reports. So your heartbeats from your data node actually come in with block reports, which, is, which are processed by the name node. Uh, for consistency in, in, the, in the presence of concurrent operations, it has a name system lock that protects against... Uh, 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 you know, accidental, uh, or, you know, um, uh, corruptions. All right. So all that is well and good. What does that give the give HDFS? What is the power of this architecture and what is proven in the industry, right? Uh, a well-tuned large cluster, right, can actually handle up to 200,000 IO operations, right? These are concurrent IO operations. It can sustain thousands of parallel applications running on a large data center. Why it can do that is because it's completely distributed architecture. Your applications are actually talking directly to the data nodes, right? Only the metadata goes to the uh, name node, right? Uh, and it can horizontally scale. We have, um, you know, large deployments out there with 10,000 data nodes also. Uh, strong consistency. The system actually is designed and architected to provide strong consistency for the data. Uh, the IO paths are um, fairly optimized. So if you think about Hadoop RPC, uh, Hadoop Common, Hadoop Security, these are very well-defined models and very widely used by a lot of components out there. Right? So that's all the good stuff. What is the bad stuff? What are we trying to solve for? Right? Uh, because uh, the name node loads all of its metadata in memory and that's the only way it can give that kind of performance. Right? Uh, it leads to challenges where you have something like a garbage collection, uh, GC pause completely debilitating the system. 
right so you have jvm heap limitations uh, you have limitations on how large your um, uh, your data set can be so you can only go up to 400 million files uh, dn block limitations of 10 million so let me talk about that too every block on the name node heap takes about 150 bytes of memory right so if you have about uh, 10 million blocks that's about 3 or 4 gigs so think about this your uh, you know background distributed uh, system actually does uh, affect the metadata how much blocks you put in it right so that's actually going to take away heap space that's obviously going to affect the name node performance so for very large systems uh, in cloudera we basically recommend our customers to not exceed 10 million block limit all right Uh, and again the startup is slow because the fs image has to be loaded the name node has to bootstrap it has to get all the block reports from the data nodes make sure that the system is in a safe state before it can let applications have a go at it all right so this is all the red stuff which is basically we are trying to solve for now let's take a look at how um, ozone metadata layer evolved from hdfs right so again we have the good old name node right the two things that we want to uh, segregate is the fs image handling and the block map Right, so how do we do that? The FS image is basically um, now moved to a ozone manager component, right? So your mapping of your keys to blocks is something that is handled by the ozone manager. Now, the famous words, and this is debatable, of uh, Butler Lampson. It's uh, you know everything in computer science can be solved with one level of indirection. So that's what we do, okay? And you'll see how. So block map, we're not managing block map block map anymore. We have created a new entity called storage container. Now, what is a storage container? This is basically a physical entity, which is your mapping of blocks to uh, chunks, your physical block files, and it is size limited to five GB. And we chose five GB because of how the current network systems, uh, uh, you know, what is the throughput of networks and how quickly we can replicate and whatnot, right? So, a five GB container. Now, how does this help Ozone? This is what gives Ozone the ten x scalability from HDFS. Now, imagine you have five uh, thousand blocks of one MB. Or you have twenty blocks of two fifty six MB. Ozone still manages them as one unit. Storage container becomes the unit of replication, and that is why we have, are managing it at a level of indirection higher than HDFS. This is what obviously gives it the scalability that we uh, see um, and desire. All right. Uh, other things that we want to get rid of. Name node has the responsibility of managing journal nodes, right? How does it do this? There is a component inside of HDFS called the QJM or the Quorum Quorum General Manager. This is what talks to Zookeeper, figures out all of the Quorum stuff, and you know uh, talks to the uh, writes the edit logs to journal nodes. We got rid of that. Uh, ZKFC has a dependency on Zookeeper where you need uh, Zookeeper for fencing and uh, uh, liveliness detection. We got rid of that too. How do we how do we do that? We actually add raft to the metadata path. So on the ozone manager, you have full three way replication, and you have raft. So all of it is self contained. There is zero external dependencies for managing replication, liveliness, and uh, availability. Okay, so that is taken care of for ozone manager, for storage container manager. All right. So that's the evolution slide. Now let me go to the high level component architecture talk about anything I might have missed here okay so on the left you see we have s3 gateway servers so what uh, gives uh, ozone the native s3 support is that we have a net translation protocol translation layer given by the s3 gateways which is uh, completely restful stateless components you can deploy them if you have a, a s3 specific use case you can put an s3 gateway on every data node and you can scale your s3 traffic and front it with a load balancer Uh, one thing to note here is that the client or the ozone client never talks to your block layer right your ozone manager is your key space your storage container manager is your block space or the container space your client never talks directly to the storage container manager you have no uh, background activity affecting your foreground right so you go directly to the ozone manager figure out which data nodes you want to read from via me as in client and go to the data nodes and talk to the data nodes all right Uh, on the right, you have recon server. So, if you have uh, dealt with HDFS, a fairly large cluster, and done get content summary, right, uh, and have faced issues with that, this completely takes it away, right? What is recon? It will basically build a state of the cluster in the background by reading uh, information from all of the three components: ozone manager, storage container manager, data nodes, and it will provide APIs for the admin to access and you know uh, query things like uh, how many small files do I have. Right? What is the health of my cluster? What is the health of my containers? Uh, and do things like um, you know DU kind of use cases, right? And also have a graphical interface for that. And this is where we are developing new features like heat maps, right? Which is very uh, often asked from the field where we want to figure out uh, where is my hot data, right? So all of that will be uh, handled offline by Recon. Offline is the keyword here. All right. 
Now let's look at the building blocks of Ozone, right? I took to, to, I talked about Raft. So Ratis is an open source TLP project that came directly from the effort of Ozone at Cloudera. And it is actually used widely in the community. We have IoT DB right now using Ratis as a library. All right. So uh, it is good adoption and uh, outside of Cloudera, outside of Ozone. All right. So um, RocksDB. So um, let's look at inside of OM. I do not spend too much time there, but we need a key value store, which where we can persist our data, right? For two things. We want to completely take uh, uh, take away the all, uh, the heap usage of the name node. And this is what allows us to do that. RocksDB allows us to actually use off heap storage, right? Use the LSM on, for the storage engine inside of OM. Ozone Manager instead of Storage Container Manager as well as the data nodes for using off heaps uh, and not using the heap memory much, right? So uh, Ozone startup times are much faster, right? HDFS, if you think about a, a very large cluster with 400 million files, it can take uh, uh, several hours to get this cluster back on a restart. In Ozone, it's a matter of single digit minutes. How we do that is because of using RocksDB on your, for our persistent storage needs inside of the different uh, uh, servers. OM and HDDS I talked about. Okay, the security model and the RPC model are basically libraries that we reuse from Hadoop because they are battle tested, proven, right? Not to have uh, uh, the same CVs repeat, repeated again in Ozone. So we basically reuse uh, some of that infra. All right, now coming to the data engineering, right? What does Ozone, um, uh, what does Ozone give for a data engineering uh, user, right? So you can see on the left here, we have your favorite S3 ingest tool, right? You can use anything from out there and talk to Ozone as if it's uh, another S3 object store, right? Not, not your traditional Hadoop, but an S3 object store. And the right hand side, you have compute experiences, right? So you can leverage Ozone as a file system, as a native file system using your uh, Hive, Spark and Impala. Right, that is the power of Ozone, um, and again, you can you have HTTPFS, so you can use a Hue file browser to actually browse the uh, file system, similar to what you do with HDFS, or you can use an S3 browser the same way to actually look at Ozone and browse your uh, uh, file system. All right, so how is the uh, metadata inside of Ozone laid out, right? Uh, this has been covered in a few slides, so I'm going to only touch on a few key points. Uh, under the slash root, you have volumes. Volumes can be thought of as tenancies, right, or business units. Uh, inside of volumes, you have buckets. Buckets are very similar to the S3 buckets. Uh, there are certain primitives in Ozone that are defined at the bucket level. Let me explain. Um, think about the FS name system lock, right? The thing that was uh, kind of, uh, uh, you know, kind of performance, main, uh, you know, um, issue for it, name node. That is now all uh, delegated to the bucket level in Ozone. So you have bucket level locks and other, not the tree, uh, the root level locks. Uh, primitives like erasure coding, primitives like snapshots, primitives like how do I want to make use of a bucket? Is it uh, meant to be an object store bucket or a file system optimized bucket are all defined as parameters at the bucket level. So it's important to understand that. Um, inside the bucket, you can have a flat key space if you are coming from S3 and using it as an object store, or you can have a hierarchical file system like view if you're using a file system optimized bucket. All right. So let me spend two minutes on what is the USB, right? And I uh, decided to name this duality at scale, which is an object store that provides you file system like semantics, right? So that this is what we we need for giving the performance and the, uh, you know, for analytics like um, applications without using something like an S3 connector. So if you have played around with HDFS and uh, S3, you know, you need some magic to actually guarantee atom atomicity. With Ozone, you, you need none of that. It's all natively built in. Right. How do we do that? Now, if you look at a bucket that is file system optimized, the directories are actually uh, you're not like a flat key space. They're actually something like inode pointers. What does that give you? Your uh, renames and deletes now become O of 1 operations. Think about doing a recursive rename on a flat key space with a million objects inside it. Right. You have to take a lock and you have to iterate each one of them. Right. Uh, with references, you have it in um, sub milliseconds. Right. So you can do a delete or a rename on a million object directory sub millisecond time. Right. So this is the power of a leveraging something like native FS semantics. And on the right, I have a comparison with a you know, benchmark that we've published as a blog a few years ago. All right. So uh, let me quickly talk about also the sizing for the lake house. How would you size ozone for the lake house? 
right um, like i said we leverage rocks db and we leverage off heap storage we have raft which basically takes away all of the um, additional components you need for availability and um, and so on and so forth you actually need to make sure that the persistent persistent store on the ozone uh, master is actually fast right so what we recommend is having a dual nvme raid 1 for ozone manager and the storage container manager and rocks db right why is this again as i explained you have the state that is loaded from the disk when uh, you query something right so you want something really fast and uh, uh, there is block cache there is all of the benefits that you get from using a lsm database at rocks db but it needs to be on a fast storage uh you can do go a lot denser so also with with hdfs what we had recommended is a maximum of about 100 tb per data node why is that uh, look at if you take a typical block size of 10 mb right uh, and you, if you look at um, uh, how many blocks uh, a block you know 10 million blocks on a data node that kind of gives you that number 100 tb right with ozone we can go 10x denser right so you can actually support one petabyte uh, data node again there are repercussions of doing that because your application times will grow your density will grow your networks are not fast enough probably right to uh, support that kind of density you want certain slas on your application workloads so um, so what we certify right now is half a petabyte but it e- easily can go up much higher in fact we have an open source partner who is testing with one petabyte data node right now all right uh, again we on the data node you can use spinning disk this is our uh, commodity hardware uh, you know uh, thing so definitely can do that uh, the dense storage nodes now also caters well to your storage and compute segregation so you can have your storage cluster you can size it differently you can have different characteristics of performance and uh, iops and everything for the storage cluster from your compute cluster and you can scale your compute elastically right so that is also something that ozone enables uh, um, and actually is designed for compared to hdfs Okay so this is just a, a sizing guide actually this is everything that I talked about in terms of numbers so if you're going at uh, it and you're figuring out how your production will look like and you know what what kind of things you have to plan for this is kind of a guide that we put out from cloudera side and we make it available to uh, pretty much all of our field folks so I've put it here just for posterity you can take a look at it and you know ask me questions later All right. So from here we go to the data migration story. So how uh, how we make it easier and what we recommend for moving from uh, different vendors or different file systems to Ozone. And Saketa will be covering that. All right. So um, once you have uh, deployed your data lake house and sized your data lake house, uh, you want to move data from your existing uh, distributed storage systems or uh, cloud native storage systems. uh this is you can since ozone exposes um, a hadoop compatible file system and an s3 uh file system interface you can use hadoop discb to move data from any number of uh, compatible uh, storage systems to ozone or you could use eng- uh, custom engineered solutions to do that uh, on this slide we have taken the example of hdfs uh so we want to if we want to move data from an existing hdfs cluster to ozone there are multiple options that you can consider you can uh, deploy a new cluster uh, with dedicated hardware hardware for ozone and uh, do a migration sidecar migration using hadoop discb or uh, you can uh, collocate uh, data disks uh, with hdfs data nodes uh, um, on um, existing data nodes uh, you can either do it on all of the data nodes or on a few data nodes uh, based on whether you're doing poc or uh, based on your data uh, storage needs and then you could slowly migrate data from hdfs to ozone and maybe decommission hdfs data nodes later on uh, a similar architecture would be uh, to uh, use an existing cluster but add new data nodes and then use the data nodes dedicatedly for uh, ozone and then move data from hdfs to ozone again um, okay uh, so then we have uh, some best practices for you to uh, consider when you are designing your namespace um so when it comes to the choice of bucket uh file system optimized buckets as i've mentioned before is optimized uh, for file system type operations uh rename and uh, atomic rename and delete uh, is available with file system optimized buckets so if you have workloads like uh, hive and palace park workloads that are designed for uh, hadoop compatible file system type uh, storage then uh, fso buckets become uh an ideal choice for these kinds of workloads uh or for, whereas an object store you could use for like pure object store workloads for data um 
like data exploration and for storing like unstructured data and things like that and uh, since ozone supports uh, two types of replication which is erasure coding and three way uh, three way replication is better for accessing hot data or if you have uh, columnar data in parquet or orc files uh, it's better uh, to uh, do three way replication uh, whereas with ec um, uh, it's ec is better for cold storage cold data storage uh, uh, kind of use cases or any other use cases that you have where you have ec in mind basically and uh, now we're going to look at iceberg for petabyte scale analysis because once you have data on the data lake house you want to run uh, some workloads to process the data and iceberg as i've mentioned before which is an open table format meant for uh, petabyte scale analytics on large data sets uh, so there are mul multiple features in iceberg that make it an ideal choice for the metadata layer Uh, iceberg is engine agnostic so if you have current workloads that are running sql on your uh, data in the data, data lake or if you have uh, um programmatic uh, uh, access uh, or if you are processing data programmatically you can use uh, both iceberg uh, iceberg supports both sql as well as api and uh, iceberg maintains the metadata uh, in the object store itself so you would avoid calling an external catalog uh, service like a hive meta store so that would make your queries uh, query planning much faster than you would with a, a traditional data warehouse system like uh, hive and iceberg also provides multiple features like hidden partitioning where um, previously in hive you you would have to create a separate column for uh, partition uh, partition column if it is not uh, if the raw data doesn't contain uh, the transformed data that you need for partitioning so that is hidden in iceberg so you can go ahead and ingest data however you want to and define your partitions uh, by transforming existing uh, data and uh, in place partition evolution is also available with uh, iceberg so you can evolve the schema of your tables in place without uh, rewriting any partitions basically and time travel uh, as we've discussed before is another feature uh, of iceberg Uh, as well as iceberg also provides out of the box uh, data compaction and supports asset transaction uh, so you can update delete merge uh, run all of these operations uh, most of them without uh, all of them without rewriting any partitions or tables so together iceberg and uh, ozone so they offer like a highly scalable data lake house solution for you uh, which is also high performant uh, so let's look at a demo now for uh, the exabyte scale simulation so we've used uh, freeon which is a load generator tool uh, this is also packaged with ozone uh, for uh, simulating this exabyte scale cluster so what we've done is uh, simulated about 5000 uh, data nodes the primary communication between the data node and the storage uh, container manager ha happens through heartbeats so which sends Uh, data node details as well as incremental and uh, full container reports so uh, so we have simulated 5000 data nodes that report like around 40000 containers that accounts to about 1 exabyte of data this is the demo so this demo is uh, monitoring the health of the scm uh, to handle this much of data so this is recon uh which is a monitoring tool that is provided by ozone so as you can see this uh, it's reporting one exabyte of data and about like 69 million containers and 5000 data nodes and uh, each data node is reporting about like 200 uh, tb of data and you will see that they are also reporting somewhere between 40 to 42000 containers each container is about 5 gigs Uh, is 5 gigs in uh, by default in ozone and okay let's move on so these are uh, some metrics that we've uh, collected so you see there's 10k heartbeats per minute uh, scm is reporting 10k heartbeats from data nodes uh, per minute and then the total of about uh, 69 million uh, uh, containers that are reported over 20 hours when the simulation was run um and then you'll see that uh, the incremental container report size is on an average around 30, you you're seeing 35 uh, container reports per minute and the full container reports uh, 
are averaging at around like 40 per minute, but have increased to uh, 40K per data node over 20 hours. And uh, when it comes to SEM heap, uh, so we're going to expand this chart. And uh, at about like one, between 140 and 150 gigs is what the SEM is using to handle this uh, exabyte uh, scale data. So with that, uh, uh, that amount of memory, you should be able to handle that much amount of data. So what we're showing, what is going to be shown right now is, uh, this is the host that is uh, running the SCM role. So we're going to see uh, CPU usage and uh, heap uh, memory usage. So CPU usage is averaging at uh, under 15% most of the time. Uh, this is throughout the 20 hours where the simulation has been run. And let's see. Yeah, so as you can see, it's like averaging at around like even under 10%, I would say, not 15%. Uh, and the uh, heap usage is also, uh, as we've seen before, it's about like 150, 150 odd gigs. That's the requirement to handle this much amount of data. And uh, while the simulation is running, SEM is still operational. So these are certain commands that we are uh, running to uh, query SEM for uh, data node details. Um, so they've come back uh, pretty fast, I'd say. Uh, and also, this is another command where we are uh, uh, just counting the number of data nodes that, the, that SEM is reporting. So it's SEM is operational and is returning uh, during the simulation. So that's the exabyte scale simulation. And then we have uh, another short demo for, it shows how uh, you can run workloads on Ozone uh, using Iceberg. Um, so this is a, uh, this is Cloudera's data lake house uh, pro uh, product. So we have a data lake, uh, give me one second. So we have a data lake with the uh, ozone. Yeah, and then I'm gonna show you what is in ozone. So if you see, look at uh, the screen, the OFS is the ozone file system protocol. Right now there's only a single volume. And this is a compute cluster that I have, Hive compute cluster, which, which is a small cluster, about 12 CPU. So I'm going to start creating iceberg tables on ozone. So this is the create table statement. So all you would need to do is in your uh, location, you would provide the ozone file system protocol instead of HDFS if you have existing workloads. I'm inserting some data with timestamp on uh, January 17th. And then the next query that will be run is uh, evolving the partition from just the date to application. So you will see that uh, the data that is inserted before uh, this uh, partition evolution happens is uh, using the older partitioning scheme. And then the data, uh, this is a uh, list uh, operation on Ozone. So you will see that older data is uh, using the older partition and newer data is being inserted with new partition partitioning scheme. So the data with timestamp uh, Jan 17th are partitioned by date and the uh, data with timestamp uh, Jan 18th are partitioned by both time, uh, date, and uh, application. So this is a small demonstration of time travel uh, iceberg feature. So I'm just uh, querying current time, and I'm <coughs> sorry, going back in time uh, about a few seconds and a minute. So you will see the state of the table um, as as it was at that point of time, at that point in time. Is going back a minute and you'll see the number of rows have reduced because I haven't ingested all of the data by that time. And then uh, I'm also going to, uh, the demo also showcases, this is a Spark compute cluster. So I have a Python file, um, a PySpark uh, job actually. So this is, I'm using Spark SQL to create a table. Again, the SQL is pretty simple. So you would uh, uh, use OFS to uh, load your data into Ozone. 
<coughs> and when you run it, uh, so the pi file is uh, inserting data into the table as well as showing the data once it's inserted. <coughs> so this is the driver logs. Once the data is inserted and uh, is selected, if it means the table is selected again, you'll see that uh, the result is available to you. So again, I'm listing the location where uh, on ozone where this data has been inserted. You'll see that uh, both the data and metadata folders are available and data, a couple of files for inserts, you'll see, are available. That's the demo and that brings us to the end of this talk.